Oh, by the way, just for, for the record, I'm no longer going by Daniel. I'm now going by Daniel. Um, I was really inspired by Tristan. I just want to make you aware that I'm no longer going by Daniel. It's now Daniel. Let's jump right into it. What's going on, everybody? Critic in the comment man here. The social dilemma. The social dilemma. What's going on? Uh, Critic in the comment man here with a little bit different episode for you guys today. We're going into the docu series episode. Uh, up today, a documentary that was floating around Netflix for a while kind of hit home, I think, for Chris and I a little bit as people who are on this this technology social media platform a lot. We are talking about, of course, the social dilemma. You guys clicked on the video, so you've probably seen it too. Um, with all Critic in the Common Man videos, you know, this is, it's kind of weird. It's a documentary, but I'm going to say it anyway. This is your spoiler warning. We're not, you know, it's not like where you're spoiling really anything, but if you haven't seen the, the social dilemma, go watch it and then watch this review. I think it'll make a lot more sense. Here's a spoiler. Um, it's talking about social media and how it's a dilemma. There you go. There you go. If you couldn't get that one, then uh, definitely go watch it. But yeah, this this was interesting, Chris, because obviously normally we watch a lot of movies. And I saw this on Netflix and it was in the top 10 for a long time. And I read what it was about. And it seemed to hit home with me a little bit before we even watch it, uh, before we had even watched it, just because I don't know about you, man, but I noticed that lately, probably in the last few years, I find myself wasting a lot of time on social media, be that Instagram, um, especially now that we have a podcast, social media going on, you know, either you or I is on that all the time. Um, you know, I'm into Facebook. I'm on YouTube for hours and hours and hours. I mean, I, I don't even YouTube, know. I man. could probably go and look through my account, but the amount of hours I've spent on YouTube in my life is dangerous. It's It's yeah. got to be like up to a year or something at this point. You'll um, never get it back. Immediate takeaways from this, Chris. Just just did it did it scare you when we watched this? Did it scare you? Did it encourage you? Did it discourage you? How did you feel coming away from this thing? Um, I mean, it definitely made me anxious watching it because um, it's true. Everything that they're saying is true. Um, it, I guess my initial impression from this documentary was that, holy shit, there's a real problem. And like, it's awesome that, that there's at least a group of people who are addressing it. And more importantly, these are not just people. These are not like just analysts or whatever. These are people that worked for the companies that that started this you know you're talking about you know the ceo of pinterest and uh or the president of pinterest and like you know just major major people that worked in this, in the beginning of social media um and you're seeing now the long-term effects that we're getting from the spread of like you know, of you know not just misinformation but the effects that social media is having on the human brain like well there were some things in this documentary that I, there were some things that scared me and there were some things that didn't because I think some of these things are a little bit over, uh, dramatized, over dra dramatic. Yeah. Are, are dramatized a little agree. bit. And then some of them I, I really think aren't, for example, one of the things they talked about, one of the first points they talked about, and these guys, uh, come in. Oh, by the way, just for, for the record, I'm no longer going by Daniel. I'm now going by Daniel. Um, I was really inspired by Tristan. Tristan. I just want to make you aware that Tristan. I'm no longer going by Daniel. It's now Daniel. Daniel. Um, I want to make sure you pronounce it right. Yep. Um, I'm Chris. But you know, they, Chris Topher. It's right? Chris. It's now Chris Topher. No, make you sure just you, you just yeah. accentuate the S. <laughs> oh, oh, so that's Chris. very Silicon Valley of you, dude. Yeah. That's very yeah. Silicon Valley of you. Thank yeah, you. I was. <laughs> I, I, you know, thank you, Tristan, for um, putting this out there. Tristan and and Job of the Dreadlock that were that were freaking wow, us yeah. out. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, wow, holy shit, we're getting hacked for sure. This has been nice knowing you guys. Our, <laughs> our page is getting taken down 100%. Um, one of the things they talked about right away was how social media is getting better at grabbing your attention and holding on to it and kind of learning your patterns, learning what you're interested in, and then targeting things to you that are more specific. This is something that you learn in marketing. It's something that you learn in, like you were saying, social media studies. This is just the way that all technologies are going. This is the way businesses are going, and it always has been. They're trying to get your attention. They're trying to get you interested. They're trying to grip you in a way that you, you know, turn to them and, and pay attention to what's going on and, and potentially convert and, and end up buying something. The thing about that is, I can't say that it scares me that social media is picking up on my habits and the pages I go to and what I'm doing and then targeting things more for me. In some ways, I think that that can be seen as a positive. Absolutely. Now, I understand that it is it is a little bit of a breach in security and it is a little bit scary to think that these companies and these social media platforms in particular are kind of looking at your patterns and then targeting things towards you. But if I'm now seeing ads that are more targeted 
towards what I'm actually interested in. And I'm seeing content that maybe is more lined up with something I'd actually like. It's very possible that through social media platforms doing this, I'm being introduced to things that I wouldn't have otherwise seen and yes. then therefore gaining something from these algorithms that are learning about me. For, for example, you could take this both ways because one good way that this does it is that like I use Instacart or Amazon Prime or whatever. One thing that right. it does is that it will pick up on patterns and suggest items that you have bought in the past. And like it, it is a more efficient way to shop for what you need by just like, you don't even have to search for it. It's right there. You, it knows that every week you've bought this particular item, you have purchased bananas every week. So it's just going to right. automatically suggest the banana. So you're, you find an item. Oh, there's another one right there. Boom, add done. That is automation in the sense. This is the way that technology was kind of meant to be. In that, you know, it's not really manipulating you. It's just learning from you. Well, it's, right. And the whole point is to make our lives easier. And exactly. they talk about that. It's it's utopia, but it's also dystopia. It's also dystopia. Yeah. And there was even that quote, the 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 line between utopia and oblivion is is whatever the end of the quote was. That was I thought that was pretty interesting. I've got a bunch of them there. up there, too. But yeah, but on, on the yeah, flip but, side of that, you also have the manipulation aspect where, you know, where we're seeing right. the, you know, the effects that it's having on, especially, you know, young girls, um, you know, right. things like that, that are on a subconscious level. Like we have the, we have the obvious parts of, of the social media and the automation of, of our data basically. But then there's the subconscious level of the things that it's kind of subliminally putting in front of us and affecting us in the long term. And I think that's the stuff that we're just now kind of seeing in, in data and stuff. Right with, you know, suicide rates and, and uh, uh, self-esteem issues in, in younger kids right, and stuff. Right, self-harm and things. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the, the, of all of the things they're talking about in The Social Dilemma, I think the one that scares me probably the most is the ease of the spread of misinformation through social media platforms. And we see that in everywhere, in every political party and every religious aspect. We... We see in, in businesses, we see the spread of misinformation like wildfire, and it's very dangerous. I mean, they talked about the flat earth conspiracy being the main one. And of course, they talked about things like Pizzagate and, and you know, what's, whatever's going on with the Wayfair thing and all these conspiracy theories. But it's crazy that somebody with a social media platform who can go on YouTube, per se, and make a video that's unchallenged, they go on there, they're not debating with anybody, it'd be like one of us going on and making a video, throwing in some big keywords, some smart vocabulary, and then trying to put videos out there, and then social media putting that in front of people that they think are susceptible to believe something like that, and then it catches on. Right, and it goes viral. People start believing that like crazy to a point where you start having people who fight over these things, people who get really entrenched in these beliefs that may or may not be real because they've been spread through social media. Yep. Um, people get killed over things like this. And um, it even mentioned in, in, the, in the thing there, it said like if, you're look, if you look for 100 people that believe the earth is flat and then have an algorithm, an algorithm that targets 1,000 more just like them, then you start getting more and more like it's it's insane. If you can find one person, you can find others. And once you find others, then you start that misinformation wildfire, as you put it. And, and you're literally just yeah. spreading it all. And we're already seeing the effects of that. We're, we've seen it. Oh, yeah. Um, my, my first note here is is that uh, they mentioned how uh, I can't remember which specific social media it was. I'm sure it wasn't just Facebook. I'm sure it was multiple. But they did studies and found that they can actually affect elections and the, and the way people vote without us knowing. Right. That they found conclusive right. evidence that they were able to sway. Sway? Yeah, persuade. Persuade. They were able to, to persuade people's opinions in, and, and change the way that they voted without the user knowing. It was all completely subconscious. Right. Well it's, it's a problem because because social media, and not just social media, I mean, media just in general, has always been a very big tool for mudslinging, for slandering, for these political parties to go on. I mean, you see it, turn on the TV at noon and go to the, go to the Jeopardy channel or the Price is Right channel, and all you see left and right, you know, right now it's Joe Biden is going gonna, is gonna to raise your taxes a thousand percent in the next commercial is talking about... Donald Trump's America is this. I mean, it's just, it's constant mudslinging, slandering on either side. Uh, Bobby we've seen Newport. that for a long time. Bobby Newport's never had a real job. 
in his life. Bobby Newport's never had a real job in his life. Bobby Newport. Bobby Newport. And now, with the ease of spread of information that is provided through social media, you're seeing a huge influx of that through platforms like Facebook, Instagram. Um, even in the ads that you're seeing, if you start getting ads that are targeted towards your political leaning, you'll start getting Democrat or, yep. or Republican ads, you know, Dem Democratic National Party or Republican National Party um, ads. You'll start seeing those. And like you said, it'll start to sway your opinion the more you're just the more these things are put in front of you, you start to see it more it's and more and more. Power, you can't really get away from it. The power of suggestion. Just the simple fact of showing the same thing over and over multiple times, that can completely change somebody's opinion because the more you see it, the more it becomes reality for you. You know, and you start thinking, well, maybe right. it, maybe there is something to it. And then over time, it just becomes something you believe in. And that's kind of the idea is how do, the whole thing about the, the data collection and social media and their ad targeting is how do you change, like they said, how do you change somebody's way of thinking long term? Not just once, but like by showing them a series of things over the course of five years, 10 years, how do you change the way they think and turn them into something that you can monetize? Yeah. Uh, this The documentary, I thought, took a little bit of a swing towards the end there to kind of an anti-capitalism stance. Um, which was a little bit different than the anti-social media stance, but I get how they tie in together. Of course, these social media platforms are a business. That's very important mm -hmm. to remember. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, they're businesses. They operate because they're making money through these this ad revenue that they generate. That's how they operate. You have to understand they're not just, it's not a free service that the federal government puts out for you to use and it's perfectly safe and sound. It's, it's a business that's just become massive. I mean, you're looking at some of the most wealthy businesses outside of maybe the oil industry, uh, you know, the technology industry and the social media industry is probably the biggest industry in the entire world yes. at this point. Um, but I thought one of the one of the most interesting points, and I don't remember which which one of the guys was saying it, uh, but he's talking about, you know, a, a tree is worth more to us dead than alive. A whale is worth more to us dead than alive. And now, one of the most interesting things is going to see how we respond to the fact that it's not the trees being mined anymore so much. It's it's now us. Yeah, he we, said, are we are the whale taken. and we are the tree. Exactly. And I think I think it's hard to watch this documentary and come away with it without trying to sound like an old person or a grandpa saying you need to get off your phone, you need to get off social yeah. media. But it is important to see something like this just so that you're aware, you know, the danger of social media in some ways is that when you're 70 years old and you're, you know, the, the analogy, right, or the metaphor, when you're 70 years old or 80 years old and you're sitting on your deathbed and you're looking back at your life, how many countless days and hours and months will you have said that you spent on social media? And it's scary in the same way that, you know, smokers, we have a lot of campaigns against anti-smoking, which of course are funded by different things that have a stance and people doing things other than smoking cigarettes. But it's very similar in that, you know, a lot of people don't realize the damage they're inflicting until it's too late. And with social media, the damage is not that you're going to get lung cancer. The damage, you know, yeah, you may have a stiff body or bad eyesight from being on your phone or something all the time. But the damage is that in 50 years, you're going to look back and say, Jesus Christ, I, I just, you know, if I look at the hours and, and, and just time overall that I spent in my life on social media, it's going to be an absurdly high number. Well, let's do the, it's uh, just kind of where our really culture quick. is going. The average person, let's say you oh, started, man. you started at 15. Let's say you live until you're 60. Uh, what is that? 45 years. So 45 years, three hours a day. So 300, right, 365. 365. So let's just say a thousand hours a year. Let's just say an estimate a thousand hours a year that you spend on social media, man. You're talking about you're talking about years of your life, years of your life. It, it's it's a long, long amount of time now. Now and again, it, you got to look at the other side of that coin, too, because I think it's also important to know that. There's an idea and I think kind of a stigma out there that at any time spent on social media is automatically wasted time Which is and not. a negative thing. It's not true. No. You can get just as much stimulation and mental you know, relaxation and enjoyment from an hour on YouTube as you could from an hour reading a book. Exactly. And I don't think a lot of people would think that if you spent an hour reading a book, it was, un, you know, it was unproductive. Whereas if you spent an hour on YouTube, even though you could be learning not just as much. Not in Back in the day, exactly. people used to exactly. say, like, why are you reading a book? Why are you wasting your time? You know, ed right. education is not important. That's what they used to say um, before right. it became the norm and before it became the law for you to have to go to school. Um, but you're right. Um, I, I th for example, this podcast, 
you know, we're we're not yeah. like obviously we want it to be entertaining and we want, you know, we try to be funny in our own way and stuff. But at the same time, we're also trying to give something to our viewers and, you know, we're trying to give something we're trying to give something to our viewers and we're also trying to get people to watch our content. So we're also guilty of saying that we're trying to to gain people's attention. Attention is a serious commodity in, in the technological era. I mean, that's 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 value. If you can get people's attention, that's where all of this value comes from. That's why that's why these social media companies are trying to get so good at keeping you in, in you know entranced on these pages and keeping you scrolling and keeping you on the page for just a little longer so they could put more ads in front of you and then potentially get your attention and convert uh, onto these ads. It's it's just business, but we're doing the same thing, and it's a weird thing to think about. We're we're out there trying to get you, the viewer, to watch us. We try to be entertaining for you, and we we enjoy this. Oh my god, dude, he's so good. <laughs> we enjoy doing this. This is what we want to do. We put tens in front of you, chewing on your jacket strings, so that people will stay, you know, watching. And we try to we try to put good content out there. Um, but I also, again, I you know, no. I don't want to come off of this saying. Because when you watch The Social Dilemma, your immediate reaction is to go all the way to the other side and say, wow, I'm turning my phone off, yes. tech-free weekend, tech-free week this week. I'm putting my phone away, locking it up, and, and not using it. But you got to understand, if you're just going to spend your time during the day, even if you're just watching TV, or even, if, even if you're just outside walking around or something, don't necessarily assume that that time is so much more valuable than time spent on social media. Yeah. Um, the truth is that we have a lot, there's 24 hours in a day, you know, you sleep for somewhere between, you know, five to eight of those, depending on what time you sleep and whatnot. There's a lot of time in the day to fill up with things. And I think the idea that you have to fill up every second of every day with something super high performing and productive and something that will have a That's clear, toxic. tangible value is, is exhausting. That's a toxic and can way be of a little bit di- It is, it is. That's a little bit dangerous too. Now people, people thrive at different levels of productivity. I'm not saying everybody needs to be on social media three hours a day. I'm not saying everybody needs to turn their phone off for a week. But I do think it's important to come away from this and say, it's important to watch this so you're aware of what's going on. So when you see an ad or, right, or a suggested group or a suggested video or whatever it is, you can say, huh, I wonder why I got suggested that. And I wonder what the algorithm is thinking of me to do this. To, to put this in front of me, why would it want to do that? And then also being able to say, okay, wow, I've been on my phone for 20 minutes and all I've done is sit here on Instagram and look at random crap that doesn't mean anything to me. If this is starting to get depressing to me, I need to understand that people portray themselves a certain way on social media and it's very rarely their their well, true life. You And you and I specifically for this podcast have fallen into that same idea. You know, We're constantly posting stuff and then thinking, how how can we get more engagement? How can we get more likes? Of course. And 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 you have to think of it in two ways. One, obviously that's toxic because just because we're not getting the uh, likes, the likes or whatever, doesn't mean that we don't have a presence here. And in that same aspect, just because we're aware that we're trying to get likes doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to because this is something that we enjoy doing and this is something that right. potentially could in some ways lead us to quitting our day jobs or, you know, whatever it is, you know, we want to, the idea is that we want to try and build something for ourselves here. And that through social media, that is the tool. That doesn't mean that we're, you know, mindless zombies or that we're toxic people because we're aware of it and we're still doing it. It's just, you have to be aware that there is an issue with social media. And just like the, really the end message of this entire documentary was that, there just needs to be a regulation of the information that's put out there. That's the idea that they want, that they think that if companies are being protected, why aren't the users? Um, and that's kind of the right. idea. Um, right. Well, and how much data How much data should really be out there? And when we sign up for these companies and we go through the login process, I know for most of us, it probably feels like forever ago. I mean, most of us signed up for our Facebook accounts 10 years ago or maybe longer, 15 years ago. Most of us signed up for our Instagram accounts. You know, I don't even know how long I've had my Instagram, years and years and years. Um, But when you, you know, if you remember the moment you sign up for these things, I mean, the login process for all these pages is you put in a lot of personal information about yourself, first of all. Phone number eight. And then the first thing a lot of them have you do is pick three interests. What are things you're interested in? Okay, now we're going to try, I mean, immediately out of the gate, they're trying to connect you with, with, 
they're trying to figure out how to sort you into a bin so that they can figure out what ads to target and, and how they can kind of make your experience more gripping and more enjoyable in social media. That's one of the first things that that's their business model. Of course. That's what they're trying to do. They they talked about it in this. Uh, they said that it's, you know, but every time we look at our phone, we're like playing a slot machine by, by just picking right. up the phone and logging into Instagram or Facebook or Pinterest or whatever, there's a chance that we will find something that we like. We are playing the slot machine every time we log in and like maybe something, you know, you checked 10 minutes ago, there wasn't anything, but now 10 minutes later, maybe there's, there's going to be something right. new that I'm going to like and that I'll be able to engage with. It's, it really is, it has to do with the reward center of your brain. You know, you, you see something that you like and there's a, a slight little bit of, of dopamine uh, that kind of gets released. I, I'm, I'm not sure if that's, that's true right. or not. I don't know what chemical. I think it is. And that, well, and especially when you get something like a like, a notification. Exactly. You're, someone interacts yeah. with you in some way. There's that, there's that feeling of wanting to be wanted, wanting to be interesting, wanting people to think about you even when you're not there. What, you know, like you were tagged in a photo. Oh, you got to immediately open it. What happened? Who was I tagged with? Someone liked your photo. Oh my, you know, you get, there's a dopamine reward there's there. My sex there's tape. a reward response system. What'd you say? There's my sex tape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, my God. But, you know, and, and I, I feel that. I mean, even with, especially when you're starting something like, you know, when you and I started this podcast, every subscribe, every like, every comment, there's a little bit of a rush. Oh, yeah. Because, because it's interaction. It's, it's a reward. It's, it's feeling justified for putting in the time and the energy to do this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Because the goal for this is to not only enjoy what we're doing, but to try to provide some sort of entertainment to the people that would watch yep. this. Some sort of laugh, or you might learn something, or we might give you a different perspective on something. That's kind of the goal for what we're doing um, when, we, when we record these things. But that can be dangerous, too. And I think that's where a lot of these younger kids fall into this trap of feeling you know their sense of meaning or worth is justified by the number of likes they're getting on pictures now yes. and it's not based on the number of real interactions or the quality of the interactions they're and having with people it's strictly based on their social presence here's a question for you do you think that as a young adult and i'm talking like between the ages of like 12 and 16 do you think that between those ages versus the age that like you and I are now, you know, in our, our early 20s for you and like my late 70s. Um, do you think that, um, there's a callback joke. Do you think that- um, yeah. Remarkably few wrinkles for someone. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's- uh, What's your secret? Shea butter. Is that a thing? Is that even a thing? I don't <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure it Pan is. Pantene OV formula, I don't know. Was, the L'Oreal No Tears Kid go. Shampoo. Yeah, that's Just the one. Drink a, a cup of that for breakfast. Every it took morning. me the longest time to figure out that that was a fish container. By the way, yeah, the little fish bottle. I had no idea. I was like, yeah. as a kid, I was like, why the fuck does this have an eye? Um, <laughs> anyways, um, do you think that as a young adult, because you are so young, that social media has a larger effect, a, a more negative effect on you versus you and I now? Like, I can't say that there is no effect. Hmm. But do you think that because we're adults and we're less impressionable and we have a larger, a better under larger, that's the Spanish English crossover, uh, a better understanding of who we are and what we want and what we expect from ourselves and where our goals are and our ambitions and everything. Do you think that there is a less negative effect on our brains versus as a young adult where your biggest, you know, your biggest issues are, well, I didn't get a like or, you know, my I'm failing my test. You know, yeah, in America, I should say, in America. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that I think that we were very lucky to have gotten social media in the way that we did because I think it was kind of crafted as we were going through those really impressionable years, and it was still growing into kind of the monster that it is now. Um, and I don't mean monster in just a negative term; I just mean the scale of it um, of a lot of these social media platforms. I think it has less of an impact on us at this age because, I mean, your life changes a lot when you're out of school, for example. When you're not in middle school, high school, college, your life changes dramatically in a social sense. Yeah. Never again are you going to be just thrust into a, a situation like college where it's a bunch of like-minded, same-age individuals who are all kind of nervous and in the same spot, and everyone's looking to make friends and meet people and have fun. That, that goes away, and that's why people are always telling you to cherish that. But to have social media be such a big part of that now, I think, is a little bit dangerous, too. 
Um, when we were, you know, when you and I were in elementary school, social media really didn't exist. No. Um, not on the scale that it does no, now. No, it was like chat when rooms we were in on middle AOL. school. Right, exactly. And, and we'd play like Neopets and shit. That was social media God, when, we were, you know, when we were in ele- elementary school. Now, when we were in middle school, I believe I was in middle school when I first made a Facebook account. Um, but it was so rudimentary at that time. I remember people having it and it was fun, but it didn't control my life. I still was much more interested in calling my friends on the phone and talking and then actually going over to people's houses. I wasn't so obsessed with social media. And then in high school, social media was very big. And of course, in college, it was really big. Mm. But I feel I do worry a little bit, you know, when, when it comes time that, that you and I potentially have children, their entire lives are going to be filled with social media in a big way, even in their education. I mean, even schools now are posting things on social media pages. Yeah. It's, it's just become a, it's become a part of our culture. Mm-hmm. And so I do worry because, like you said, I think it's very much a bigger impact when you're younger and life is so much more about your social identity than it is now. I mean, dude, the closest person to age Uh, to my age that I work with, there's a couple younger people now on my team, but at my work for a long time, the closest person to me in age was like in their forties. I mean, you're talking about almost a 20 year age gap. You think those people give a crap about what you're posting on social media? I mean, I, you know, for the most part, most people in their fifties and older, and this is, this is a stereotype. I know this is not the case for everybody, not, not the case for a lot of people, but in my experience, people, you know, fifties and up, don't really care that much about social media it's because it's not been such a big part of their life. Well, and it's more it's more so that they grew up in a time that was vastly different than ours. Um, exactly. And so their their own beliefs, their own core values are just very different than ours. Right. You know, I do feel like it has a bigger impact to a younger person more so because the world when you're younger and you're in school and you're around all your friends all the time, the world is so much more about your social identity and how you fit into those groups, how you fit in amongst your peers. And it's such, when you're so impressionable and it matters so much, it's such a big part of your life to be liked or, you know, to, to not embarrass yourself or whatever it is. And social media can be used in a very dangerous way in that sense where it can, it can have a very negative impact on people's lives. Yeah. Cause it has the potential uh, to know, be take, something different right but you're right right, um especially for younger audiences which unfortunately are the bigger are the bigger market because it's so easy to target somebody young and then in a in in that same sense you're targeting their parents because they're the ones that are going to buy them the thing that you're trying to market or whatever right um right and and you're really you're manipulating the fact that they are still growing which i mean that's ultimately what you're doing you're manipulating a young person's mind into thinking the way you want them to think in order to make some money I think it's very important that we educate younger generations on the impact that social media can have in your lives. Absolutely. And I think that we are in some sense, I think that that topic is being brought up more and more. But, and I, you know, I almost mean in a sense of almost like the D.A.R.E. program. I don't know if you had the D.A.R.E. program in school. Like oh, the, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. You know, the, the drug, the anti-drug program, yeah. essentially. I did so many drugs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, man, they put me through. They put me through that scared straight program. It was crazy. Yep. I had to spend the night in prison. Um, <laughs> I just, I think it's important that we at least educate kids on saying, "Hey, look, you know, do I think that TikTok should be banned in America? I don't know about that. I mean, yeah, there's a part that you know you need to be sensitive, careful about what kind of sensitive data you put out there, but that's not even really what I'm talking about. I think. The reason why something like the social social dilemma is important to watch is not so that you're going to turn your phone off and throw it away and get a get a you know a little fire kit so you can make smoke signals for your friends everywhere you go. I think it's so that you can at least be aware of the how the the business is working behind the screen and what the intent is and how they're they're trying to manipulate your actions in some way. They're trying to get you to buy something. Yeah. They're trying to hold your attention. Social media pages are trying to get you to follow them. They're trying to put information out there. And you need to be careful. You need to be able to filter out the nonsense. You See, need to be able to filter out the bullshit because there's a lot of it out there. And I think it's important to try and educate the youth about this kind of thing. But then you're getting into the into the realm of like, well, how do you make something, you know, quote unquote hip and, and not feel like it's yeah. an after school special? And I think that unfortunately, the, the thing that we do, especially with sex education and um, and, and, and any sort of like social media education or anti-bullying or anything, it all comes off as preachy and, and like hunky dory, like, you know, you're a special butterfly and don't let anybody tell, like, it doesn't come off as real. We treat our young adults like they're children 
And I think the only way to get across the, the real value of what social media is trying to accomplish and what it's ultimately subconsciously doing to our brains is to treat them like adults and say, look, dude, like this is the shit that you're like, you have to present it in a way that is going to open their eyes because unfortunately most young adults nowadays are just completely uh, unfazed by the, by most of that information. They just don't care because yeah. we've been trained to think well, on short term we... levels we expect as as people and i'd imagine as parents and stuff too just from kind of my my experience as a kid growing up and and you know talking to my friends we expect our kids to just learn so many important about so many important things from their friends or something because it feels so weird to talk about it like we expect our kids to learn about sex from their friends kind of like you have yeah. the talk or whatever but for the most part, you you expect our kids to learn about sex from their friends. You expect our kids to learn about a lot of things in life from their peers. Yeah, you know, and and we we just skim the surface, and we on, on a lot of these topics like sexual education, like drug education, we we do the bare you know, and that's minimum. That's not to say that you know parents should like expose all their kids to a bunch of different kinds of drugs or anything like that, but it just seems like it's almost such a taboo to talk about these kind of things. To your, to your kids, I think social media doesn't need to become one of those things. And I understand it does sound preachy, and we sound kind of old school just even talking about this like that. I mean, but, yeah. But, you know, it's it's not that you need to put this phone away all the time. I, you know, social media has become part of our culture. Kids are, kids are always going to be on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. We are. We are, and we're not kids. You know what I mean? So we're, they're going to do the same thing. But I think it's important to have a conversation and say, hey, look, like, you're going to see people doing amazing, incredible, you know, crazy things on Instagram or, or social media. Sometimes, you know, people, it, it becomes so easy to compare yourself to people that you're seeing on social media because people portray their life as being perfect. You don't see a lot of people post on, on you know, the bad days or the bad things that happen to them on Instagram. It's, oh, I took this trip or I got these shoes or I look at my new phone or look at my new car. And when you see that, you start to compare yourself to that and you start to wonder why you aren't where they are or have what they have. That can be really dangerous too. That's where all of that data comes into play is, you know, like they're, they're, they're pruning you basically for every little bit of information that they can get from you that they can then use to affect the way that you would vote or spend or anything really. Um, and it's, it's kind of crazy to think that it, you know, obviously the, the documentary showed it as, you know, like weird three like three triplets not three triplets triplets um who are like controlling his like avatar or whatever right. but it you know it, it gets across the point that it really is this like faceless entity that's kind of this algorithm that's affecting what's being what's being put in front of you um and it's it's crazy it's crazy to think about it i had kind of a weird thought when i was watching this documentary and i don't know if there's any su real substance to this but i'm just going to put it out there and see what happens um do you think that social media has the potential to kind of prevent people from either changing or or swaying people into becoming different versions of themselves than they would be, say, without it? And what I mean by that is, okay, take all the things that you're interested in right now. Let's say you're interested in Star Wars, you're interested in sports cars, and you're interested in podcasts. Well, that's what you're interested in right now. And people, people generally change. People's interests change. Their hobbies and activities change. If you're constantly being, by, bom being bombarded by those topics on social media because that's what the algorithm thinks you like right now and that's who you are right now, do you think that by doing that, by creating these algorithms that try to pinpoint exactly who you are and exactly what you like, they put you in a box mm -hmm. and they sort of... They sort of stereotype you into into what you are right this yeah, moment so you, you and never your grow social media it. right your social media prevents you from maybe being able to see things outside of that that you would have ventured into had they not maybe put you in such a box with this algorithm Ooh, that's hard um i think there is some validity to that i i absolutely do i think that there is some mind-numbing aspect to it that social media would right. in in it inadvertently do but I also think that depending on what age you are, I think as adults or as, as just human beings, as you become an adult, there is this s level of growth that you can't get. You can't stop it. Your, your brain as, an, as a human is wired to change. It's wired for experiences. And I think especially with the age of social media, I think people get bored more easily. And I think that kind of stuff 
you know, I guess it depends. It's like maybe it will make you love the the 1997 Corvette because you you remember having that you know put in front of you over and over. Um, you like right. this, you know, you specifically like Genesis. Um, Jesus, I am so dating myself. 1997 <laughs> Corvette and Genesis. That's full the color. Classic Oldsmobile, yeah, cool. you know, the one with the extra large trunk. And I think that there are some subliminal things that are just going to attach themselves to your psyche, but I don't think they're going to be long-term formative things i think that it's gonna you're you're as a human i think you're just gonna want new experiences and social media is kind of that way of getting those new experiences without really leaving the comfort of your home so i think it's a yes and no it's, it's kind of hard to tell well what about what about for the younger generation whose lives are so much more shaped by social media do you think that it's possible that we're gonna see kids gen z and beyond who maybe are not so much themselves and are more so who the algorithms behind the social media platforms think that they are. Yeah. And they may be very close, but you could have a lot of people with some weird identity crises kind of things where they feel like they need to fit a certain mold because maybe somebody wants to be an, in, an influencer on Instagram for a while and then that becomes their life and they become so entrenched that that and that social media has such a tight grip on them that they don't really end up breaking out of that to, to grow and change into something else that they maybe would have become. Um, I, I think it's possible yeah. that you're going to see people who, again, are not maybe their true versions of themselves, but are who, you know, who Facebook has pinned you to be or who Instagram has pinned you to be. Which is a fair, like, I think that's fair to ask. Um, I think there's two, there's two things there that, that kind of, that you brought up in my mind. One is that um, you could very easily get into, and this is going back to kind of the last question too, you could very easily get into the weird almost like the giver situation um, where mm. everybody is being taught to believe a certain way. Right. And, and if social media becomes this larger entity instead of, you know, Instagram, Facebook, all of these dozens of apps, if somehow one app becomes this over, this like overlord thing, you know, where like it is the source of information kind of in the same way that Google is, but on, on a much more focused sense, you know, like maybe it's something that's manipulated by the government which is terrifying to think about. But if if there if everybody is exposed to one social media and it becomes a part of culture, I think then you run the risk of everybody becoming kind of like a zombie and not really in that they're not that they're mindless or anything, but in the sense that the opinion of everybody kind of becomes the same. Um yeah, exactly, because it's all based on who has the biggest influence on social media. And when you've got people on YouTube like, uh, you know, Logan Paul or whatever, who's got 20 million subscribers, 200 million subscribers, whatever the number is, these people become superstars. Mm -hmm. These people become social icons, and, and people, they have a following almost, almost in like a cult sense. Yeah. These people that try to kind of emulate their lives after these people. Yeah. And so they're not really them. They're trying to kind of become this version of them that they think other people are going to accept more. And I think that problem has always been there. People always try to kind of be who they think other people are going to like. And I think that could be exponentially worse in the age where social media is there from the time you're 10 years old. Yeah. Um, and th to answer the other part of your question, though, I think that could some could social media lead somebody away from being what they were meant to be it's kind of like asking you know like maybe 400 years ago the world's best golfer could have been born but they were born 400 years ago and so we'll never know mm, i think it's kind yeah. of like you know you're not to say that like fate is a thing or anything but like i think that what you're meant to do is the thing that you're going to be meant to do and and right what you're meant to do is what you end up doing yeah that's exactly what has been done Right. As crazy as that sentence is. What you're what you're meant to do is what you end up doing because right. that's what's because been you're done. and not wow. because it's like fate or anything, but because you're a product of your environment. Yeah. Um uh because like the whole fate thing, that's a whole other conversation that, you know, like gets really weirdly spiritual and everything. But it, when focused on like the social media aspect, yeah, I, I think that um hey, you get away from that. That's a battery. Um yeah, I just think that it's it's a little too much, I think, to say that social media will stop you from becoming something else, because I think that there's a lot of other aspects that go into that. Um, yeah. Now, going back to the social dilemma itself a little bit, I did think it was a little bit hypocritical how a lot of the people that we were listening to 
kind of warn us against the dangers of all these things. Not everybody, but I, I understand they got, you know, industry experts, people who are in this for a while, but it seemed like a lot of these people, it's like, okay, I've worked for Facebook for 10 years and made my millions. And now that I'm, you know, rich and living in Silicon Valley, well, now I'm going to step back and tell you about the dangers of these things. And it got to a point where it's like, you know, I appreciate them stepping out and, and kind of talking to us about maybe what's behind the curtain. But at the same time, it's like, you know, they worked for these companies for a long time. Yeah. And a lot of these people, you know, were CEOs of different ones and, and were the masterminds behind creating and, and targeting these social media platforms to be kind of the dangerous thing that they are. I thought it was a little hypocritical of them to now all of a sudden step out from behind the curtain and be like, well, when I was executive of Facebook for 10 years, now that I'm $300 million richer, don't use Facebook. But it's then, like, okay. But then it's like... It's, it's weird because I had that same thought and then I was like, holy shit, like what is this? Like these guys are, you know, as far as we can tell, just trying to help and trying to bring awareness to the situation. And here I am judging them because of their money. And I'm like, holy shit, is that just social media and the like the misinformation and the conspiracy theories hey. that that it's been like putting into my brain? Like now suddenly I'm just expected to hate this these people because they're millionaires. And, and I was like, holy shit, like this is... Not because they're millionaires, but because they worked forever to basically t make all the things they're like scaring us off yeah. of to make those things happen. And now all of a sudden they're trying to tell us about the fears as if social media is this distinct thing. And it's like, no, you guys were the big the ones responsible for pulling this along and not putting any sort of regulation and whatnot. And now that you've stepped away from it, but do you think any of these people other than Tristan, <laughs> do you think any of these people would have been willing to step away from their roles 10 years ago when no. they were in the heat of it, making Absolutely all this not. money? And you know, I, Again, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna like try to try to berate the people because that's that's missing the point. But I did think just as a note, I thought it was a little bit hypocritical how these people yeah. who had made probably millions and millions of dollars doing these things for these social media companies that they're warning us against, and now all of a sudden that they've retired and had a long, nice career, now they step away and say, Oh, these people are dangerous and they don't care about you. It's like, well, you're that person. Like yeah. you're what you're telling us to fear. But then you're it's the like kind of person and it's like damned if they do, damned if they don't. Like they they're stepping forward. Right. Like they're assholes You're for right. having it was, done it in the first place, but then they're assholes for you know, for coming forward. It's it is. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, what's done is what's done is done, and you're right. It, it is better that they actually come out and, and show us what's going on. It's like the, the creators of the it, atomic bomb. You know, it's like what are like what are we gonna right. do? For, you know? I have become death. I am destroyer become death. of worlds. Yep, fuck or, it. Yeah, I am that's, become death uh, or whatever. That's Oppenheimer for those of you. Um, that's a crazy statement. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, and I did think a little bit of it got a little bit fear mongering. Yes, and that was um, my next it, question it did kinda, for you. It was a little bit, but um, I mean, you can fire away too. But I guess my my main question, and this is a this is a loaded question, and it's kind of unfair to even ask. But I mean, do you think moving forward, do you think social media will be a more not technology per se, but social media? Do you think social media will be a bigger positive force or a bigger bigger negative force in the world in the next fifty years? Um, you know, it's great that you can contact all your friends and see what everybody's doing and keep up with everybody. And it's horrible that, you know, suicide rates are through the roof and everyone's comparing themselves to the beautiful people that get a million likes on, on Instagram and Facebook and whatever. It, it, uh, it's a double edged sword for sure. Um, I think that social media is, is here. It's here now. Uh, and, and there were intentions good intentions for this like like they mentioned at the beginning you know people have gotten organ donations because of things like this um right. people have found long lost relatives you know that people connected from across the world there is a goodness there is an an, an inherent goodness in, in the idea that we're connecting the world and in 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 some ways it's not just misinformation but dude there's real information that's being spread now and awareness to things that we had no idea was happening 20 years ago and so in some ways, yes, social media has made us more anxious and more afraid and more conspiracy theoretorial, conspiracy theoretorial. Um, <laughs> but in other ways, it's, it's also bringing awareness to things that we should know about and connecting us. Right. And I think in some ways, in a beneficial way, is, is kind of creating the, the human race as one race as opposed to all of these different borders. And I think we're seeing aspects of that with yeah. all of these social rights movements, um, things happening in Hong Kong. I think we're seeing people tired of the way that they're being ordered and bossed around by, by governments that don't have anything it's, uh, for them. 
it's definitely a globalizing thing. Yes. No doubt about it. Um, no I, doubt about it. And it's I and I think that it's we're living we were living, I should say, I think, in the time of nationalism from pre World War Two until the end of like the Cold War era and into the the age of technology, you had the idea that your government, uh, not your government, but your country was was what you needed to you had to serve your country. That's why World War Two happened. And, and World War One is the idea that like I have to serve because it's my duty. And it wasn't until the 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 beginning of of social media, not really social media, but media in general, with uh, the coverage of Vietnam and the, and the coverage of wars and, and the social rights movements and the television that kind of started bringing attention to the viewers and bringing us information that we had no idea was out there. That's when you started seeing people start thinking like, well, why do I want to go fight in Vietnam? And, and the, right. the civil rights movement started happening. And then all of the shit that we were willing to look past started to, it, it in a weird way, educated us. There's the media gave us information and made us think differently. And now we're seeing that through today. And social media is now bringing awareness to even more broader things because we have it instantly. And I think that we're seeing this stepping away from nationalism and the idea that our country is our life force and more in the sense that like you said globalization that the world is our life force and that we're we need to be protecting it and i think that that is beautiful about social media that is a beautiful yeah. aspect of it but we need to be wary of the negative aspects of it and the and the, the other side of it you know it's it's amazing how polarizing uh, you know things like social media can can become you know, you see, you see injustice going on, and everybody has an opinion. It allows you to be, you know, not to get too V for Vendetta ish, but when you're sitting behind a keyboard, it allows people to kind of show their true nature a little bit. Um, you yes, conceal yourself a, a little bit, and so you start to see. Yeah, you, you know, when you put on that mask, you start to see things, and so people's people's true intentions come to light. All of this information comes out there and it's it's become such a polarizing thing where a video will get posted of someone getting, you know, beat up by the police and half the people are saying, you know, throw the cops in jail, arrest the cops. And half the people are saying, oh, you don't know what happened before the video. It's it, you know, and it's hard because a lot of times social media can put incomplete information out there Absolutely. one way or another. And that's very scary. Um, but, yeah, it is definitely a globalizing tool. I think of, of all the things on the social dilemma that scared me the most it's it's how rapidly misinformation can be spread. I think that's the most dangerous thing that you need to make people aware of, especially if you have kids that are really into social media or if you yourself are really into social media. You need to be able to take a step back and look at something and say, "Hey, this might be bullshit." Yeah. You might be you need to look at something and say, "Hey, these people are saying the earth is flat, blah blah blah." You know, this might be bullshit. Which it is. Maybe I should step back. Yeah, maybe I should step back and and take a look at this and maybe do some independent research and try to make my own uh, own opinions. Yeah. Maybe not be so quick to to jump on the opinion train of somebody on social media. And and it I think that kind of ties into like what I think was the the best quote of the entire documentary was that social media is not necessarily the existential threat that we're trying to face. We're not. Social media just happens and 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 the way that the algorithms work and everything it brings out the worst in us and the worst in humans is the existential threat that yeah. we are not able to deal with the shit that we have with our greed and our um, our envy and all of that where we as a as a human race are not getting past that and that is what ultimately right. could lead to the shitty situations in the world like you know wars and stuff like that it's all power um, yeah, it is. And we need to work through that in order to take the actions that we need to on climate change and on uncovering the truth, which is that the world is actually flat. Um, we need to know <laughs> that, you know, stop hiding it from us. Oh, my God. Dude, I have so many arguments against that. Exactly <laughs> crazy, man. You're like, but I have this whole book called Science. Dude, it's brutal. Yeah, it's brutal. But um yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely recommend if you, you know, that people watch this. And I don't, you know, we're not in any position to be like preachy about this kind of stuff. We're not experts. But I will say, you know, I've noticed positive and negative effects to the influence that social media has on my life personally. 
Uh, it gives us the platform to do this, which I love. I love doing this podcast. It may never turn into anything. As you guys know, at this time, we have like 29 subscribers, you know, just a hundred or so followers or whatever. It's not a big thing, but we enjoy doing it. It gives us a platform to, to do this kind of thing. Um, it also gives a platform for people to come on here in the comment section and tell us we're ugly and stupid and horrible at this and awful. And we decide if we choose to believe that and how much impact we want to let that have on us. I think you and I yes. are both have the personality, fortunately, where we can look at that and say, go fuck yourself or cool, whatever. But a lot of people don't. Yeah. Oh, you um, see you it too? You need to be really careful. You need to, you need to be able to cut through that a little mm -hmm. bit. I think that's a very important skill that we're going to have to start training the younger generations yes. of people to have as people adjust to life in the technological era. Uh, like you said, social media is here. Yeah. It's not going away. No. Um, you don't, you don't connect be the world in this way and then sever that. You can't. Right. People because, would lose their And mind. the reason why, the reason why is because vast, for, for the majority of things that social media have, has done, they've been very positive. Like they said, dude, you can, you can get on your phone and in 30 minutes have plane ticket spot and set up to take a trip to the other side of the world and go experience and explore. You can press some buttons and have a pizza show up at your door in 15 minutes. It's amazing. You can press some buttons and have a car ready to take you anywhere you want to go in 15 minutes. It's an amazing tool. Yeah. Um, but there are there are dangers to social media, just like there are dangers to uh, operating a vehicle. And it's not, the, dangers it's not to social media that's the danger. It's our reaction to it. Right. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, I think um, I, I I don't know if you're ready to wrap it up or not, but um, I think that uh, something that my mom once told me, love that woman. Um, <laughs> I remember the biggest thing that I learned when I was young, I was probably 10 years old, 11 years old. And I remember I used to love drawing and this kid came in, this new kid came to school and he was, I thought I was good, but holy shit, this kid could draw, like, just yeah. from, from his mind. Like, I was like, hey, draw an airplane. He drew an airplane. I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. You're, you're incredible. He probably went on to do something with his art. It affected me, and I remember coming home, and I was like, because like, people would come to me when they, like, wanted something drawn for their projects. And suddenly they're going to this yep. kid, this fucking new yep. kid. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and I remember I told my mom that, and the, the biggest lesson that I ever took away from that, she said you're always going to be better than somebody and worse than somebody else. And it's better that you learn that now. And I remember hearing that. And to this day, to this day, it is something that I take to heart because I think that is one of the best lessons you could ever learn, especially as a young kid. You're never going to be the best, no matter what. You will never be the best. You may be better than some and worse than others. I think that ultimately that is what social media does is that it makes you feel like you need to be the best. And that's not going to happen because you might be the best for a year or two years or five, but eventually somebody will supplant you. And I think it's better to just be happy yeah. with what you have and what you were given and what you're able to do. Focus on what you can do instead of the things that you can't do. Focus on what you have rather than what you don't. That's what yeah, I'm going to leave very you guys easy, with. It's very easy to compare yourselves to other people. And we've been doing that long before social media. It's just, you know, instead of comparing yourselves to the, you know, few people in your classroom now all of a sudden you're comparing yourselves to the 10,000 people that you come across every week on social media or whatever it is and it becomes hard um, and I'm not surprised that the you know self-harm rates and in depression rates and all these things are up because you know life is hard life is rough for a lot of people and it's hard to you know go to work to a job that you hate and have a rough day and get on social media and see Dwayne Johnson in his $150,000 truck in his $10 million mansion on a movie set with Kevin Hart laughing, having fun. And meanwhile, you're flipping fucking burgers and getting yelled at by some Karen who's pissed off because she got onions or whatever. And it's hard to, it's hard to compare yourself like that. Yeah. But it's also a good motivating factor if you let it be one too. You know what I mean? Social media can also motivate you to get to a level to aspire to be like the people or better than the people that you see. I think that competition is healthy personally. Um, so I think it can be used as a tool for good too, but people have to at least be, again, have to be aware of the dangers of social media and the dangers of social media, much like, you know, in the way that we, we talk about smoking, you don't see it while it's happening, but all of a sudden in 20 years, you're going to look back and say, wow, I wasn't really there for my child that much. I don't really know who they are because I spent 
three hours a day on YouTube? Or what could I do with that time that I could get back? Time is the most valuable commodity that we have. And we choose, we have to choose very carefully what we give it to. If you choose to give it to Instagram, the explore feed for three hours a day, that's fine if that's what makes you happy. But just be aware that you're never going to get that back. Mm -hmm. And social media is formulated and driven to be a tool that grips you and holds your attention for much longer than you would naturally want it to hold your attention. Yes. Um, and that can be dangerous when all of a sudden you look at your screen time and you've spent four hours a day on YouTube for the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you start putting that in perspective and you realize, wow, that's been a really unproductive time, potentially. Um, you need to be aware of that. Um, it definitely made me want to try to do like a tech-free weekend kind of thing, um, which of course is easier said than done, especially when you're somebody who, you know, hosts a podcast, your tech, technology, social media kind of becomes part of your life. But Because then you're just sitting there just like... I really yeah but yeah like just sitting here what do, what do we do now but i enjoyed this i'm really glad that we watched it um i hope you guys like this discussion of it i know this is a little different we're not experts you know you don't have to listen to our opinions on these things but chris and i did this because we enjoy having a little bit of a platform we like having these conversations we'd be talking about this one way or another if it wasn't on the podcast to you guys you and i'd be playing sea of thieves uh you know and talking about this on there so it's it's just a fun medium for us to to put this out you got anything else for this one chris um or do you want to you want to go ahead and wrap it up um no i think uh i think we pretty much said everything that needs to be said just anybody that's watching this that is feeling the effects of social media and you know maybe resonated with the thing just know that you what you do for a living has no value on what your worth is and neither does your follower count or your like count like um i love you danny hates you but i love you uh, yeah, absolutely and also even, with that said that um i am selling my used underwear and i will put my only fans right here <laughs> i got a bathwater link coming up yeah. um you can find that you can find that in the comments down below <laughs> um leave a comment let us know i mean let's keep the discussion going if you guys want i know you know again we're just here we are here we are poking for that engagement but um let's let's do it let's you know let's do it if if you have anything you want to say about this one we respond to all the comments i mean it'll be real interaction leave a comment down below and let us know what you think um, if you think it was overhyped, was it fear mongering? Was it relevant? Was it important? What'd you guys think of the social dilemma? Um, you know, we'll do these every once in a while, these documentaries. I had a lot of fun doing this. I'm glad we watched it. Um, you know, we'll mostly be doing movies and TV shows. Of course, that's what this podcast yeah. is, but we wanted to open up the discussion to something a little more real. Um, leave a comment down below, drop a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It helps our channel grow. Um, as you guys know, um, based on, you know, the thing maybe it'll it'll put our channel in front of somebody else and then you know they'll spend hours and hours watching Please, we, oh, need it. we need the validation that's freaky so uh chris and daniel are out of here um chris. god that bothered me as soon as they said like so it's it's tristan right i was like oh my god <laughs> you think that guy went by tristan in high school no probably not, not a shot no. that dude was tristan until he got a six-figure job in silicon valley and then all of a sudden he was tristan his whole life he was he... like oh that's not my name <laughs> The second he, the second he walked through the doors at Google, and saw all the all the crazy you know individual people there, he's like, oh, I'm I'm Tristan. I'm Tristan, now. fuck I'm, you. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Cool. All right, Chris, um, we're out of here. That's it, guys. Our our review and discussion of the social dilemma. Cue music. Uh, let us know what you thought. Yeah, we really appreciated it. Cue the music. Uh, give us some love on social media. You know how it works now, so you know you know we're the the men behind the curtains. This is it. All right, Chris, we're out of here. We'll be back with another video up soon. 